Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody is having a great day. Um, I'm going to get right to it today because this is a fairly long story. Uh, I have to be completely honest with you. I've been struggling whether or not uh, I should actually tell the story, but uh, this story is definitely not for children. Um, I reached out to the writer and we spoke for about an hour and a half and uh, I found this story to be compelling, heartbreaking. Uh, I cried at times um, but I think this story does need to be heard and I, I believe that the writer, that's all the writer really wants is that uh, first of all his children hear it and I, I really think that he just doesn't want this to happen to anybody else again. So again guys really make sure that the little ones don't listen in because this is not not that pleasant in spots okay so I'm going to get right to it hi Leslie my name is Tommy I live in northern Minnesota I have been listening to you on cryptids Canada for quite a while and I must say that there is something soothing and trusting about your voice that is appealing to me and I listen to your stories every night as I try to sleep I heard you say recently that you were in need of stories and or encounters, and that you were scraping the bottom of the barrel for stories. That is definitely par for the course. I thought long and hard about whether to send you my encounter, and at this point, my health is so bad that if I don't do it now, I probably won't ever do it. I love what you are doing and how you do it, Leslie. Thank you. I also want to send you my condolences about the loss of your treasured friend. That must be very hard on you. My prayers go up to you during this time of loss and acceptance, hun. My time is short on this earth as I am 61, last stages of COPD, living in a pandemic with a virus that loves to attack elderly poor lungs. I am a disabled U.S. Navy vet with lungs that are shot from my service working in the bottom of ships with asbestos. I live alone in a small house in a small town in the middle of nowhere and I have no friends. Leslie, I suggest you read this encounter to yourself first and then decide if you should read it to your viewers, if you so choose. You might want to edit some of the colorful but true language. I have already removed all the F words and abbreviated others. It's rather long, but I believe you and your listeners will find it a very unusual yet interesting encounter. As when I was a child, I was grabbed by a large female Sasquatch and walked out of a swamp. I am going to copy-paste this chapter from my book simply because I don't want to type it all over again. I have refrained from sending this to you for a long time, but my time is about up, so it's now or never. From what I understand, children also listen to your channel I believe children should not hear the violent things that some children have been subjected to at the hands of some very bad people who are entrusted with their care. I have removed most of these abuses from the encounter, but I realize that to understand and relate to the story effectively, some things have to remain. A few years ago, for the first time in my life, I told this story to Wes Germer of Sasquatch Chronicles. I sent the written version to him back when his channel was new. He contacted me to be on his podcast and I declined. He continued to call me regularly for two years, asking me how I was doing and if I would reconsider being a guest on his show. And I continued to decline until finally I gave in and told my story on his show. Episode number 442, Sasquatch Saves Child. That was over two years ago. Since then, I have declined many offers and invitations to be a guest on many other podcasts. It was very hard to tell my encounter to Wes, and after the interview, I swore I would never do that again. But about a year ago, I did send it to Steve Isdall at How to Hunt, but I don't think he wanted to use it. He didn't read it or respond. I also sent it to Cam at Dixie Cryptid, and he responded by emailing, explaining that although it was a unique and fascinating encounter, the child abuse and torture portions were too violent for his young listeners, and rightly so, I agreed. 
I have spent four hours editing my encounter to remove the parts about the abuse, and I tried to edit out most of the swearing as well. After my experience with Wes and the many, many comments from survivors of child abuse left on YouTube, I decided to try and write my whole story. I was surprised by how much emotional crap it would dredge up within me and how it had affected me to remember, write down in detail the horrors of my youth. I did finish it one and a half years ago, and it almost killed me literally, and I published it. It's available on Amazon Kindle, entitled The Agony of One Child's Weeping by Tommy C. Eugene. Leslie, I'm not telling you this to promote my book. As a matter of fact, it has been out there for two years and I have never promoted or advertised it in any way. It has sold about 15 copies. So please understand that this is not about notoriety or money. I only wrote the book because I wanted to leave an explanation to my children as to why I have been so weird all their lives. I never told them of my abuse or my encounters. I wanted them to be free of fear and to explore this wonderful world, including the wilderness. Of course, Leslie, you're welcome to a free emailed PDF copy if you so choose. And if you choose to share the book's info to your listeners, that's fine. But fair warning, the book of my life is not for the faint at heart. It contains the vivid and horrible recollection of my past including child abuse, incest, torture, and sexual abuse, and, of course, the monsters in the woods. It also includes the colorful and foul language that is as I heard it and as I expressed in my youth. You are welcome to use or delete or edit my email in any way you so choose, including using the above intro, which I decided to use because I want you guys to understand all of what was told to me. Um, I didn't want to leave out these parts because this is really, really raw emotion. I just really wanted you guys to understand what is about to come because if you can't handle it, I would really rather you just turn it off because the last thing I want to do is alienate any one of you. Okay, so this is uh, a chapter from his book, chapter 24, and he titles it The Monster from the Woods. It was late winter of 1973. I was 12 years old. I was born and raised in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, a northern suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota. I am number six in a family of 12 children. Because I continued to run away, escaping abuse at home, I was deemed incorrigible by my parents, who never knew of my abuse, and sent me to the Ramsey County Juvenile Courts, who sent me to a foster home on a farm in northern Minnesota, Willow River, and I was left to the actions and vices of a sadistic, child-abusing, a-hole farmer who tortured me and his farm animals on a daily basis. I won't go into details about the abuse or torture, but to say it was horrific would be putting it mildly. The day of my encounter with the swamp monster went like this. I don't know what Don did with the bloody mess in the sheep shed after I stormed out of the barn crying that day, but I know what I did. I ran up the driveway and started running down the road in my duck boots. I could not get the red blood images out of my head, and I cried all the way up the road. You see, I got attached to the calves like they were our pets. Unlike the adult cows, they are the little and cute ones. We named them, and they followed us around like puppies. We fed them with sucker buckets and cared for them every day and played with them. It was a total shock for a boy to see them get ripped apart and eaten alive by a pack of filthy screaming pigs. Don was a spitten image of Clint Eastwood in the movie Gran Torino. The same look, attitude, and pissy demeanor. I started running away whenever Don abused me. When I first started to run away from him, he would catch me right away because I didn't know where I was, where to go, or how to get away. The farm was located approximately 10 miles west of the small farming town of Willow River in the middle of a large state forest. 
I was lost here. So when I ran after being tortured, I always just ran down the trail to the back hay field or out into the front field or just run down the middle of the dry gravel road until he would figure out I was missing and inevitably come after me, either on Thunder the Horse or with his rusty old 67 Ford LTD that had no muffler and smelled like a cow pie inside. I could hear his car coming down the gravel road after me from a long ways because his car had no muffler. But I usually didn't get off the road and hide. I just ran on the road until he pulled up next to me and slammed on the brakes. He would come flying out of the car, swearing and yelling at me, and he would go directly to his trunk and bring out a 10-foot length of hemp rope, tie the rope around my wrists and to the end of his trailer hitch, all the while yelling and swearing at me. Then he would drive me back. He would be in his car with his head hanging out the window, yelling back at me, saying things like, You think you're so smart? You don't know crap, you dumb SOB. You like running away, eh? How you like that running now? And he would speed up the car a little more from a walking pace to a jogging pace. I was pretty tired by the time he caught up to me a couple of miles down the gravel road from the farm. So I couldn't keep up the running behind for very long. I would eventually fall and start screaming, but he wouldn't stop and he would drag me the rest of the way back to the farm down the gravel road. That damn gravel left more cuts and bruises on me than I thought possible. I would be sore a week. At 61, my back and legs still bear the scars. And then the whippings and beatings and torture would begin again. He drug me back to that farm, down that gravel road, at least eight times during my time there. I had made a plan in my head. The next time, I was going to run off the road, cross the swamp, and get into the woods. But I was afraid of the woods and the swamp that were on both sides of the road. I would guess there was about 30 yards of swamp, maybe more, that ran from the road right up to the thick woods. I didn't like the swamps or woods around Don's place. I know now why I was so afraid of the swamps, and it was because I had heard loud howls, whoops, tree-breaking branches, strange noises that I couldn't explain, and whenever I was near those woods or running along the same area of woods on the road, there was something weird going on in there. I heard it, I sensed it, and I felt it, and I was afraid. But this time, I shrugged the noise and feelings off, assuming it was just the unknown local wildlife, and I jumped down into that wet ditch when I heard his car coming up the road about a mile back behind me. I was right where the noise always came from in the woods, but I didn't care. I had to go now or he would see me and capture me and probably make me clean up all that blood in the sheep shed. Oh God, I can't go back there, no way. On the road, there are no other farms or houses. It's very desolate, just a few wooded forests with a 30-yard strip of swamp on both sides of the five-mile gravel road. So I jumped off the right side of the road and down into the swamp, and I started heading across the swamp, hoping to cross it to the tree line and into the forest that is beyond the swamp. It's a state forest, and it extends for many miles in all directions. I knew I was going to be soaking wet by the time I got over to the woods, but it would be worth it to get away from him. The swamp is much deeper than I thought, and the water is getting deeper and muckier with every step I take and I'm panicking and struggling to get through the swamp before Don's car gets to where I am. My feet are sinking and sinking into the mud, and I'm struggling with every step to get my feet free of the muck with my boots on. I'm wearing those tall green rubber duck boots the farmers wear. I'm quickly realizing that it's too deep, and I'm not going to be able to cross this swamp to the tree line beyond it. The water is higher than my boots now. The mosquitoes and the deer flies are thick as hell in there and I'm getting eaten alive. Don's car comes and I duck behind the cattails and his car goes by slowly. He didn't notice me about 15 yards out in the swamp area so I have to avoid him for another moment but I know he will turn around at the highway about five miles up and come back like he always does. I'm stuck in the swamp and struggling to keep my boots on and it's getting deep. It's up to my chest now, and I wonder how I will keep my head afloat if it gets any deeper, and if I will even make it to the woods. 
I'm panicking. I'm sinking. My feet are stuck in the mud up to my knees. My boots are full of muck, and the water above the muck is up to my chest. The more I struggle, the more I sink in the swamp muck. I'm pulling at the cattails and reeds. I'm screaming and crying out loud, wishing Dawn had seen me, because a beating is better than drowning. I realize that I'm alone, that no one will ever know I was in the swamp. Now I'm really freaking out, and my screams got louder and my panic increases. I get a few more struggling steps, and now I'm up to my neck. I'm crying out loud now, and the swamp water is getting in my eyes and in my mouth. All of a sudden, from the woods, I hear the sound of branches and trees breaking, and something heavy stomping through the forest towards me. Crash, 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 then splash. I look up expecting to see a bear or something because it sounded like it was a herd of buffalo and they were blasting through the trees. About 30 feet away from me on the edge of the swamp is a, what am I seeing? It's a monster. It's at least nine or 10 feet tall and it's massive. It's huge. I have seen a lot of monster movies and this is a monster. It's just standing there, breathing hard and looking at me. I notice right away that whatever it is, it's female because of the large hairy breasts. Weird how a 12-year-old beginning puberty will notice breasts, even on a monster. But breasts or not, it's a huge hairy monster and I'm screaming and struggling and I'm stuck in the swamp water and choking and I don't know if I'm going to drown. I stop struggling in the direction going away from the road and turn away from the monster and start struggling back towards the road. But I can't get my boots loose of the muck. After pulling so hard, I was seeing stars. I was finally able to pull both of my feet out of the muck-filled duck boots one at a time and get a few more steps. As this huge, brown, hairy monster starts coming straight towards me, then I realize my mistake. Without the boots to somewhat support my feet in the muck, My tiny, slippery little feet slide even further into the muck under the water with the weight of my body, and I'm up to my mouth in the water. I'm dizzy from struggling and screaming and panicking. I have stars swimming around the inside of my head. My lungs are are burning, and I'm choking on the swamp water in my mouth. This monster is almost on top of me now, but it never made a noise. No growling, roaring, nothing. It seemed to glide when it walked effortlessly through the swamp towards me. The swamp water seemed only to come to its knees, and as it got to within five feet of me, I thought for sure it was going to just rip me apart or kill me and take me to its babies for dinner. But it did not. I was cowering down with my hands and arms over my head and my face mostly in the water as the shadow of this beast surrounded me. All of a sudden, Even through the water, I noticed this terrible stench, like a box of long dead skunks mixed with dog poop, ammonia, and barf on top of all that. The worst thing I have ever smelled, ever. My father owned a garbage company when I was a boy, and trust me, I have smelled the worst things you can smell. And this beast smelled worse than the worst things I have ever smelled. And that is saying a lot. Then, everything got silent. The creature was standing over the top of me, just staring at me. I was face down in the swamp with my hands over my head and my eyes closed tightly, crying and coughing and spitting up swamp water. Then I heard this beast make a long exhale, like a sigh, like it felt compassion or something. Hard to explain the emotion, but we both just froze for a moment, and except for my choking, the swamp was completely silent. Everything was silent like someone plugged my ears. It was like this beast woman was trying to decide what to do with me. It had the appearance of a wild animal, a monster, but its eyes had intelligence to them. Dare I say, like a human? In that moment, I realized she was much, much more than just a wild animal. She, it, took another slow step closer to me, and I felt its cold, wet, mucky, hairy hand slowly grabbed the back of my jacket and my neck and pulled me straight up out of the swamp. Gosh, it was strong. I had long hair, and when it grabbed my jacket at the back of my neck, it got some of my hair in its fist, and it was ripping the hair out of the back of my neck. 
I am swinging my little fists above and behind my my head, hitting this beast on the forearm. But it was like hitting a log with hair on it. It was so rock hard and muscular. I have never been so afraid of anything in my life. Not Dawn or any other monster. This monster scared me so bad, I started peeing my pants. And as I felt the warmth of my urine run down my leg into my wet jeans, I started kicking and flailing my feet and twisting my body around to get loose. But it had me tighten its strong grip. Its fist was bigger than my whole head. The more I struggled, the more my hair was getting ripped out. It effortlessly held me out in front of it. The best way to compare the beast's size to my own is if you can imagine holding a large rabbit by the skin or fur of its neck out in front of you. I was the size of the rabbit next to a large man. I'm sure it must have been 9 to 10 feet tall and 4 to 5 feet wide at the shoulders or more. So I'm screaming and crying and swinging around helplessly but facing away from it or being held out in front of it by my hair and the back of my collar of my coat. She takes one slow and cautious step towards the road at first, stops, looks around, then starts moving swiftly and smoothly towards the road. Its gait and its fluidness of motion were so foreign to me. She didn't step so much as glide or seem to slide each foot forward without the rest of her body moving. Next time you're walking, pay attention to how your whole body moves up and down with each step. The creature's body did not move up and down as it walked. Its legs moved independently from its upper body. It was almost like being on one of those walking sidewalks at the airport. Do you know that feeling? Like the surrounding scenes are moving way faster than your actual steps? Like you're on roller skates when everybody else isn't? I don't know, that's just the best way I can describe that motion or feeling of it walking. It seemed to only take about 10 seconds and we were back at the edge of the ditch next to the road. It took me about 5 minutes to get out of there and in trouble, struggling all the way, but it moved smoothly and quickly back to the gravel road in a matter of seconds. She, it, stopped at the ditch, facing the road. It looked left and then right waiting a second or two, then tossing me into the wet ditch on her left side with her right arm while she's still facing the road. Then she turned her whole body to the left facing me and just looked at me. I was afraid to look at this creature's face, so I laid where she threw me on the wet, swampy ditch. I kept my arms and hands tightly wrapped around my head, only peeking out and up at her face a couple of times, wondering what it was going to do to me next. What I saw in her face was not mean, but firm, in control, confident. She was looking past me up the road. Then she turned her whole body to her right and looked up the road where Dawn would be coming from. Then she turned back to me, then up the road, then back to me. This was no animal I ever heard of. It sort of looked more like a human than a monster. It cocked its massive head to one side and looked straight into my eyes with a look of sadness and confusion, then a frustration. In its face, I saw another person with feelings and emotions, not a flesh-ripping monster. Other than a dog, what animal has emotions in their face and eyes? And compassion. I distinctively saw compassion in this monster's face. I would look at her, then cover up and look down then at her, then down again. Once, as I looked quickly at her face, I saw her rocking anxiously from side to side. Then its face tensed up and grimaced. I saw her face turn to anger, so I quickly covered my head again because I thought maybe she was going to attack me because I was looking at her. That's when I distinctively heard her say to me in my brain, not in words, if I had let you drown... You would just bring trouble to my tribe. How do I explain that? I heard her emotions like she was speaking, but it was not speech. It was emotion, a forced emotion. Again, she turned her head and shoulders together and looked up the road. And that's when I just began to hear the sound of Dawn's loud car coming slowly back down the gravel road about three quarters of a mile away. The creature turned and looked at me again and huffed, 
and immediately turned around and walked back into the swamp the same way it brought me back. It walked firmly and confidently back through the swamp to the tree line, stepped up from the swamp and into the woods, and with a few more crashes and crunches of breaking branches, she was gone. Holy crap! That's when I remembered about what she looked like. What I can tell you about the face is that first reminded me of a carnival bearded lady. I know how silly that sounds, but that is what she looked like to me. A 12-year-old scared-to-death kid who only saw a beard on a lady in a carnival once. She really did not look like a woman other than those breasts and the motherly emotions she was displaying. She had long, wet, dirty, tangled, dark brown hair draped in front of her eyes and nose, but it was in little tendrils and easy to see through. The top layer of her hair was lighter brown in spots, sun-bleached, and was curled or hanging in thick strands, sort of like dreadlocks, all around her head. The hair was matted and dirty. The hair hung off the bottom of her arms and sides about five inches like an orangutan and with a long, dirty beard that seemed to start under her eyes and went down and merged with the mustache and continued to flow all the way off the chin and into the beard of at least six inches long. Her hair, not fur, was full of dried brown pine needles and twigs, bugs and clumps of mud. I'll never forget the skin. It was dark gray, sort of like a gorilla, and her hands were huge and thick with long nails that were streaked with brown and black and very dirty and chipped. Huge dark brown to black eyes, dark, deep set without whites that I could see. The brow ridge was pronounced and made her eyes angry looking, but not angry at me. And the nose was wide and flat like a boxer or something, but not human. The nasal openings were oval slits. If I had to pick a Bigfoot type that she most resembled, it would have to be a huge built of Patty, the Patterson-Gimlin film, but larger with much longer messy, dirty hair. Well, that's about all I could see. The feet were big, of course, but in proportion to her legs, which were wide and covered with hair and mud. I couldn't really see much above the feet because they were standing in the swamp and her feet were squishing down below the muddy water line. So I only saw above the ankles, and they were covered with mud and dirt and hair. So Don pulls up a few moments later and saw me laying in a puddle in the ditch, crying, and he yells, There you are, you sorry SOB. Why are you all wet and laying in the mud? He gets out of the car and looks at me close and yells, Where are your damn work boots? He takes a couple of careful steps down the slope and into the ditch and grabs me by my wet jacket and yanks me up out of the ditch, drags me over to the car and screams, You stink, boy. Where have you been? You smell like you've been out wrestling with skunks. I was crying in that little spurt way, and my words were coming out one syllable at a time. I keep sobbing and not making sense, and then he immediately gets impatient and interrupts me with, Shut up. You're not sitting in my car stinking like that. Get in the damn trunk. He snarled as he grabbed the keys from the ignition and went to the back of the car, stuck the key in and opened the trunk and pointed towards it. Get in. I was cold and wet and shaking uncontrollably, probably in shock, and my eyes were burning from the swamp scum and the stinking ammonia skunk smell of my clothes. I tried to control my sobbing, but my teeth chattered as I cried. I slowly climbed into the dusty, dirty trunk with a spare tire and tools, and he slammed the lid down and it banged on my head. Don drove me back to the farm, as he had done many times before. I was surprised that he didn't drag me this time. He made me throw the jacket away. We couldn't get the smell out of it, and he blew it off that I somehow got tangled with a skunk, a dead skunk. He called me stinky for a few days, but I didn't care. I didn't plan on sticking around there much longer anyways. I ran again a couple of weeks later as soon as I had another opportunity. And that time I made it all the way to the highway and got help from the Willow River town constable. He knew all about me, Don and his abuse of me. The whole town knew about me. The teachers, the parents, the bus driver. But no one ever said a word. I was there about seven months 
The constable picked me up from my friend's house and brought me to his house. And after a couple of days and many phone calls, he brought me back to the Twin Cities and I was brought home and not sent back. I never told anyone about the Bigfoot. Who would believe me? Hell, if no one would believe me about the abuse I suffered from Dawn with my layers of bruises and cuts and scrapes looking them in the face. You really think they're going to believe a troubled kid telling a story about a monster that pulled them out of the swamp? No way. I dealt with this never-ending nightmares about Dawn, the bloody calves and pigs, but mostly of the monster all my life. I still deal with it. I can still see its face looking at me with its head and shoulders tilted to the side, confused and angry, but not at me, and probably wondering why I would stay where I was treated so poorly. Or maybe she was concerned and confused about the violence our species seemed to inflict upon its own. And maybe it was none of those things, and she was just curious about me, like a kid with a new bug in a glass jar. When I was about 45, I started searching the internet. There, I started seeing creatures, cryptids, and monsters. I was blown away. I really thought monsters were just in the movies, and that all of what happened to me could never be true until I found the internet. Then I was furious. I was angry that the wildlife authorities, the rangers, the cops, or the government would have told us or warned us like they do about grizzlies, sharks, alligators, right? Well, when I was a kid, my mind had shut down and did not allow me to remember most of what happened to, my, to me as a child. Abuse or torture included it was only after I was 25 when I stopped running from the fear of the darkness, my sleep, and the black hole in my memory. Everything from age 8 to 14 was a blank. That's only showed itself in my nightmares. That I might start to get those memories back. It was horrible to see me, to have someone, something, or some place all of a sudden slammed me with pictures and memories of traumas I had suffered years earlier. I thought I was going crazy, so I tried my best to keep those crazy, scary thoughts hidden. With drugs and booze, relationships, hot rods and traveling, none of it stopped even after consuming thoughts and fears that I had, wondering and fearing what I would remember next. In 46 years, I have never gone into the woods again. No camping, no tents, no trail hiking, no fishing from the shore, no way. She, it, may have saved me, but it also meant there were monsters in the woods, in Minnesota and lots of other places. No, the woods were and are a frightening place for me. That's where they keep the monsters, the big freaking monsters. I went through three failed marriages and never spoke of it to the first two, and then was ridiculed and told I was just making up stories when I finally spoke of it to my third wife. Those who knew me when I was about 14 know I was qui a quiet, shy kid who spent all of his time at the library. I was obsessed with finding out what I en had encountered and what it was called. But I was constantly frustrated at not finding what I saw. At home, I was the one who was always looking into and studying the World Book Encyclopedias, 22 volumes. I was always looking for answers to unasked questions. I was looking for a needle in the world of haystacks, but I didn't even know what the needle is. In those days, in our little town, there was not much in libraries about Sasquatch. There are some conjecture about the Yeti, but that was on the other side of the world from me. And I didn't even know then what I was looking for. I was looking at monkeys, gorillas, and apes, bears, and the like. I didn't even realize I had an encounter with a Sasquatch until I was in my mid-40s and found them on the internet. But even seeing the many grainy, out-of-focus pictures and videos of those dang things, as Steve Idstall would say, I was unsatisfied. I did not see one picture that was exactly like the one that followed me into the woods or the one that grabbed me out of the swamp when I was a child. Sure, some close but long-haired, some with long hair, 
but not the face. I have spent the better part of 10 years constantly looking into and listening to encounters, podcasts, movies, videos, etc. It's an obsession that I cannot remove from my mind. I know I had several encounters with the Sasquatch, but it was crazy to even think someone would listen, let alone believe. So I figured I would take the story to my grave. Well, almost. I just want to add that about a year ago, I went back to that farm with my son and his girlfriend. It was the last time I ever went back there. If you listen to me telling my encounter to Wes, I tell of going back there once with my brother and dealing with Don when I was about 22. The point I wanted to make is that when I went back there with my son last year, they described a very strange feeling while we were there. We stopped at the side of the road where the swamp encounter took place, and my son just wanted to leave. We drove four hours to go there, but spent only five minutes there. They were both noticeably full of anxiety and fear, and said this place had a bad feeling about it, a feeling of doom and oppression, and they just wanted to leave. We did. You know what, Leslie? When I was a young guy about ten, my friend and I trapped a muskrat a mink, fox, etc., in and around the lush swamps and wilderness, and we loved the woods. But it was all stolen from me in five minutes when I was 12. I'm 61 years old, and in the last month of my life, I have late-stage COPD, I'm on a disability from the Navy, and I live alone in a small town in the middle of nowhere on the vast, flat, treeless prairies of northern Minnesota near North Dakota. Perfect not a forest in sight. Leslie, I only sent you my encounter because I trust that you and your listeners will believe it, or should believe it. The tribes of Sasquatch are not all ruthless killers looking to attack humans. They prefer to never encounter us, but we humans are encroaching more and more onto their habitat. And and when we encounter them, we bring weapons and electronics, and they just want us to go away. They just want to be left alone. And they do that in a very scary way, like screaming, throwing rocks or logs or kicking over trees to make their point. Go away. Leave us alone. The book I wrote a couple of years ago was written when I first began to get very ill and was only written so that my three children will know why I've been so damn weird all my life. It includes two other encounters that I won't go into and so much more. It's been published on Amazon Kindle entitled The Agony of One Child's Weeping by Tommy C. Eugene. You don't have to mention it if you choose not to, Leslie. It never sold more than a few copies because I never advertised it to promote it in any way. It's a tough but truthful account and I could give a shit if anyone believes me or not. It's not about money or attention. Hell, Amazon has sent me 15 bucks in two years. If I wanted to get famous, I would be on every podcast, show, or site dealing with Sasquatch or create one of my own or three to get publicity. Not interested. But now I feel if I don't tell the truth of my encounters and abuses now, it will never be known. Folks need to hear my story and make up their own minds. And every time I see one of those reality shows, like Finding Bigfoot, I see the government still trying to make us believe Sasquatch is a joke, a hoax. And every time I see someone comment about how Sasquatch are not real, and that it's all a hoax, I shake my head, feel the thin patch of hair on the back of my neck that's saying to myself, what ignorant idiots. Someday, long after I'm gone, hopefully the species tribes will be acknowledged and protected, and we, as knowers, will all be silently vindicated. Thanks so much for your time, Leslie. If you got through this, I thank you. I know how valuable your time is and how little time you have for these long letters. You are welcome to tell, reprint, forward, edit, or use this email in any way you so choose. You're also welcome to include my name, Submitted truthfully, Tommy C. Eugene, Northern Minnesota, and he included his phone number in the bottom with his email. Well, Tommy, first and foremost, I want to say that I'm sorry that you went through all of that. 
Uh, second of all, I hope that I did your story justice. And to the audience, I just want you to know that this story affected me in a way that I just can't explain. It's something that we're hearing so much more lately. Uh, child abuse, child abduction, and child sex rings. It's all over the news, and it's something we should not be turning away from. Uh, these two subjects did go hand in hand, so I left it as the writer wanted me to. Um, and that's it, guys. Uh, I think we should just take a little time, think this through, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Also, I'm going to leave instructions on how you can find this episode on Sasquatch Chronicles with Woody in the detail box below. Okay, guys, I think that's going to be it for tonight. I hope to see you all back here in a couple of days. Bye for now.